Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm so glad that you're watching today's message. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. I believe it'll encourage you, it'll strengthen you, and it'll empower you to make Jesus famous in your everyday life. Enjoy today's message, and I'll see you at the end of the broadcast. There is a call upon your life. Another word for calls is invitation. God has invited you to do something wonderful with your life. But will you answer his call? We talked about that a lot last week when we talked about the heroes of faith, Deborah and Barak. Will you answer God's call upon your life? And so I'm not going to do a lot of review because there's so much review. This is part six. There's so much review. And so I'm not going to read the reflection questions, but you'll see them in the notes. But for the sake of review, setting up what happens again is the end of Judges chapter 2 reveals the cyclical or even spiral nature of the book that they sin, they're oppressed, they repent, they deliver it, they have peace and prosperity, then they sin again, then they're oppressed, they repent, they're delivered, then they have peace and prosperity, then they sin again. It's a cycle. And one of the reasons I call it a spiral because the scripture also says they got worse with every single generation. And so I gave you several reflection questions as I already mentioned. And one, one of the things I said a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned again last week, was that these judges that we've studied so far, and we're going to study again tonight, these judges partnered with the Holy Spirit through their faith. The Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 lets us know that these judges we're studying are examples of faith, and we can learn from them concerning how to use our faith. We also saw there are some things that we shouldn't do. And so let's go to... Let's look at these notes a little bit more. And so remember, we are to learn, there are so many things to learn what to do and what not to do when it concerns them. What to do and what not to do. But one of the things we can learn from is their faith. And one of the things we understand is these judges partnered with the Holy Spirit through their faith. Although the Holy Spirit will land on them, they would still need to act. As the scripture says, one in the old, once in the Old Testament and three times in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith. So faith is a lifestyle, not just a moment or a movement. It is a lifestyle that pleases God. And as we shared in our introduction to the series, we have to learn from the faith of the judges. The judges had faith that God empowered them to fulfill their assignment. When the Holy Spirit landed upon them, he anointed them for their assignment. One of the things we covered before, we'll mention again tonight, and we'll mention again when we get to Samson and Jephthah, is that although the Holy Spirit anointed them, although the Holy Spirit landed upon them, that does not mean he approved their, all of the things that they did, or their lifestyle, or that they did everything right. Remember, we said that the Lord would raise up judges in response to the people's cry of repentance and because of his mercy and his compassion. That doesn't mean these judges did everything right. Now, one of the things we see the first group of judges from Othniel to Deborah and Barak, they did mostly right. We really don't see anything, you know, them and Ehud and a few others, Shamgar. We see really no faults in what they did. But when you get to Gideon and Jephthah, and Samson, it's a different story altogether. Some had promising starts and a horrible endings. But the things we learn, we can learn what to do and what not to do when we study these people's lives. You know, I've heard it said before that you can learn from anybody. You can even learn from a fool, even if it's learning what not to do. And so one of the things we can learn from these judges is how to use our faith, especially with partnering with the Holy Spirit who's anointing us. And so we said a couple weeks ago that keys to daily operating under his anointing. Here are a few keys to daily operating under the anointing of the Spirit, which is his empowerment, his ability, his grace. We said, number one, daily ask for his guidance. Number two, daily ask for his insight. Number three, daily ask for his help. Number four, acknowledge the anointing that's on your life. And number five, expect God results. Once again, these are all in the notes. I'm speeding through them. But also you can listen to this message again on our podcast as well as watch it again on our YouTube channel and on our Faith Plus app. We said, remember, God raised up the judges as a response to Israel's repentance, prayer, and because of his compassion. He raised up the judge by placing his spirit upon them. The judge was raised up by the anointing. In the same way you're being raised up by the spirit of God, being raised up by the anointing to fulfill God's plan for your life. The Lord is raising you up to do something. And remember, as I emphasized again and again and again and again and again last week, it will be accomplished by the power of his spirit and your obedience to the spirit what god is raising you up to do will be accomplished by the power of the spirit and your obedience to the spirit so let's go to judges chapter 6 
I'm going to start with verse 1, and tonight we're talking about Gideon. He's one of the familiar judges to us. You know, Gideon is very familiar to most of us. Samson is very familiar. And so we're going to look a little bit at Gideon tonight. Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 1. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. That's important. I'll tell you why in a moment. And leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey, for they will come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished. Remember before they're talking about greatly oppressed. Now it's even worse. They're not just greatly oppressed. Now they're also greatly impoverished. So this is even worse than the oppression that fell on part of the land in the previous generation. They were greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So let's give a historical background. Who were the Midianites? The Midian, remember, Midian was a son of Abraham and Keturah. Remember that Abraham married Keturah after the death of Sarah. The Midianites were nomadic people and were merchants and traders. When Moses fled from Pharaoh, he fled to the land of Midian, where he married his wife. Moses' father-in-law was known as the priest of Midian. Nearly 80 years later, the elders of Midian hired Balaam to curse Israel. When that didn't work, they consulted with Balaam and learned how they could ensnare or trap Israel through sexual immorality and worshiping false gods. The Midianites were also allies of the Moabites. Now in Judges 6, they lead a confederacy of tribes from the east, and they are the oppressors of Israel in this chapter, in this story. Their oppression of Israel was so severe that the Israelites fled the open country and lived in the caves of the mountains. Gaza was west of the tribes of Israel. Remember we said it was one of the main five cities of the Philistines. This verse that we saw in Judges 6 lets you know that the Midianites swarmed the land. Why do I use the word swarm? Because it says they were so numerous, them and the Malachites and the tribes of the east were so numerous, they says they couldn't count them and they were like the locusts when locusts would swarm the land and eat up everything. And so this, these Midianites swarmed the land with their numbers, with their camels, with how they devoured and burned things and took things. And they laid waste to the nation, not even a small area, because some of these places in the book of Judges said it was concerning small parts of the land of Israel. This one, because they came from the east, that's east of the tribes of Israel, and they went all the way to the westernmost parts off of the sea in one of the Philistine cities. So they crossed all of Israel and oppressed. This level of oppression not only was severe, not only did it greatly impoverish them, but it affects more than half of the tribes of Israel. Remember we said certain of the oppression, certain sins and cycles affected one or two tribes or here and there. This one is affecting more than half of the tribes of Israel. This is a serious deal that lasts seven years. Let's go to verse seven. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, remember it's going on for seven years, and they don't automatically start praying or repenting, but eventually they start praying and repenting. And they begin to call out to God. And God sends a prophet, and he, and he goes throughout the children of Israel and says to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Remember, we've said it again and again in the study. They had a covenant. This is an old covenant. They had a covenant. It was based off of laws. If they adhered to the laws, this would happen. But if they didn't, this would happen. So these are the terms of the covenant. What's happening is what they agreed to in their covenant. And God, by his prophet, is reminding them, you did not listen to me, even though I did all of these things for you. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was an Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Asbarite, which while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. 
Now that phrase doesn't mean a lot to us. Okay, he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Most of us don't know what an ancient wine press looks like or how to thresh wheat. But threshing wheat is an activity that takes a lot of space and a lot of room. It was threshing floors. It was a wider room. But a wine press is a small place, even in the earth in these ancient times. And so what's happening is he's doing an activity that takes up a lot of space in a small little room. Why? He's afraid of the Midianites. It also lets you know how much he's actually threshing. It's not a lot. It's enough to go into the small wine press. And now while he's doing this, the angel of the Lord appears to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Notice something about this. Notice about this. He says, the Lord is with you. He said, will be with you, has been with you. He's with you right now, Gideon and the wine press, hiding from the Midianites in this small little spot. The Lord is with you. Come on, say it with me right now. Put it in the chat. Say, the Lord is with me. Come on, say it out loud. Put it in the chat, wherever you are. The Lord is with me. Because although Gideon needed this reminder, you might need this reminder too. And you who has a new covenant better than Gideon, you should know that the Lord is always with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. So say, the Lord is with me. Come on, one more time. Put it in the chat. Say it out loud. Say it with some faith. Say it with some confidence. Say it with some boldness. Say, the Lord is with me. Come on, bonus time. Say, the Lord is with me. And then he calls him mighty man of valor. Let that sink in. Because you would think a mighty man of valor wouldn't be hiding in a wine press from the Midianites. And so God was speaking something over him that he wasn't yet. God has a habit of calling us by what we'll do in the future, even when our present doesn't line up to it. He'll call who he sees us, who he's planned us to be. He calls us what he's called us. And it's our job to keep growing and rise up and let the spirit of God raise us up, cooperate with the spirit of God to walk in the fullness of what he's called us to do. Now, he, this is not a thing he only did with Gideon. Remember, Jesus also did with Peter. He called Peter a rock. Now, one of the things about a rock, it's, it's sturdy. It's foundational. It can be counted upon. Even though Peter was kind of sturdy in the, first three, in the three years of Jesus' ministry, in his first three years involved with the rest of the twelve, he wasn't as sturdy as he would become. Jesus was speaking to him and was speaking and pulling out his destiny with his words. God has spoken some things over your life. It's time for you to agree with what God says about you. Come on, say it with me and put it in the chat. Say, it's time for me to agree with what God says about me. One more time, say it with me and put it in the chat. Say, it's time for me to agree with what God says about me. So say it this way. Say, I agree with what God says about me. I agree with what God says about me. Another way to say that is amen and so be it. Whatever he says about me, amen and so be it, I agree. Praise God. Let's keep going. Verse 13, and Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord. Now, verse 13 is, O oh my Lord, in Hebrew, this is a title used in referring to men. So he does not know it's the angel of the Lord yet. He does not know that. So he thinks it's just another man talking to him. He says, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us. Now, specifically, the angel of the Lord said, God is with you. But now he said, if God is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Well, what's the answer to that question? The prophet answered it earlier in the chapter. He says, all this is happening because you guys have forsook God. You did not do what he said. That's why it's happened. God has already answered that question. And God's already answered a lot of your questions out there. But you actually get up and do what he told you to do. And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But the, now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. It's a question two, and question two will be answered later. So pay attention to the second question. Where are all his miracles? Where are his miracles? These miracles we heard about from our fathers, how he brought us out of Egypt. This is what the, remember, this is what the prophet said. This is what the prophet's been preaching throughout Israel. So where are his miracles? That's question two, and we'll get back to that. So go ahead and put it in the chat, say question two. Come on, put it in the chat, say question two. So go on to verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I 
save Israel. Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Pause. Note about verse 15. Now this phrase in the Hebrew, O my Lord, is a title used in referring to God. So now Gideon has realized he's not just talking to another man. He knows he's talking to the Lord. And so he even changes how he addresses him. He says, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So he's coming up with excuses. My, cl my clan, where I come from, is the weakest. Manasseh is not that strong. My tribe is not that strong within Manasseh. My clan is not that strong. I am the weakest one in my father's house. He's coming up with a whole bunch of excuses. You know, we come up with excuses all the time when God calls us to do something. So this leads me to the next reflection question. What excuses are you giving God? You know, Moses had excuses. And now Gideon has excuses. What excuses are you giving God? That's your next reflection question for tonight. What excuses are you giving God? Because God does not care about your excuses. If he's called you, he already knows every excuse that you plan to give. And he has an answer for every single one. So it's time out for bringing up excuses. And it's time to go forward with the plan of God. Come on, say it out loud. Say it's time out for my excuses. Put it in the chat and say it out loud. Say it is time out for my excuses. Come on, one more time. Say it out loud. Put it in the chat. Say it's time out for my excuses. Praise God. Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, surely I'll be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Remember the greeting of the angel of the Lord. He said, the Lord is with you. And then he lets them know that he has been sent by the Lord. And now he reminds them that he will be with him. The emphasis and the reminder is I'm with you. I'm sending you. I got you. Verse 17, then he said to him, this is Gideon speaking to the Lord. If now I found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the, he put the broth in the pot and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. The angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed off his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he, was the that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an Ophrah of the Asperites. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull and second bull seven years old and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock and the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him, because, but, notice this, but, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Now, we, this is the first time we see mentioned God's name, Jehovah Shalom, which means the God of peace, or Jehovah is peace, or the God who sends peace. This name, Jehovah Shalom, means the God of peace, Jehovah is peace, and he's the God who sends peace. Also, the name, the word Shalom means peace, completeness, health, prosperity, safety, tranquility, the peace that comes from being whole. We can refer to it as nothing missing and nothing broken. Of course, all these are in your notes as well. Gideon's first assignment from the Lord was to tear down his father's altar to Baal. Gideon's first assignment from the Lord was to tear down his father's altar to Baal. And so notice it, it clearly emphasized that Gideon was too afraid of his father's house and the people of the city to do it by day, so he did it at night. And so let's go to verse 28. And when the men of the city rose early in the morning, there was, an al there was the altar of Baal torn down and the wooden image that was beside it cut down. And the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So they said one to another, who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, 
would you plead for bail or would you defend bail? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. Notice one of the things we see that although Israel as a nation has begun to repent and a lot of Israel has repented and prayed, there are those who are still worshiping and defending Baal in the midst of them. Therefore, on that day, he called him, or Gideon, renamed Gideon Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, or let Baal defend himself. So Gideon picks up a new name, a nickname, which is known throughout the scripture as Jerubbabel, which means let Baal plead against him, or let Baal defend himself, because he has torn down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Malachites and the people these gathered together, and they crossed over the encamped in the valley of Jezreel. Why? They're coming to destroy the harvest. Now notice what happened next. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Remember, so these judges were raised up by the Spirit of God. They were raised up by the anointing of God. The Holy Spirit comes upon Gideon. Then he, Gideon, blew the trumpet, and the Azabezrites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. So these tribes are sending troops. Gideon asked. They responded. They're going out to battle. And they came up to meet him. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you'll save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he arose the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there's dew on all the ground. So what do we see? Gideon put out a fleece, a physical fleece, to kind of test God. God, if you really want me to do this, then let this happen. Let the fleece be uh, wet and let the whole ground be dry. And then next time, let, you know, the fleece be dry, let the whole ground be wet. He's putting out a fleece to test God to make sure his leading is right. Now, this is what Gideon did. Just notice, this is what Gideon did. And here's why you shouldn't put out a fleece. Because a lot of people say, well, Gideon put out a fleece, I can put out a fleece. No, 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 you are not Gideon. Now, remember, Gideon was under an old covenant. You have a better one. You have a new covenant based on better promises. So here are three reasons why you shouldn't put out a fleece. And you put these down in your notes because you do not want to put out a fleece. Number one, Gideon was under an old covenant. You have a better one. Number two, Gideon was spiritually dead. So, well, Pastor, how can he say that? Gideon had the Holy Spirit upon him. He was anointed by God. Sure he was, but he was spiritually dead. Remember, in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit only rested on prophets, priests, and kings, and those with special assignments like the judges. He rested upon them for temporary times for assignments. He did not live on the inside of them. They were spiritually dead. But what happened under this new covenant, you have the opportunity to be born again, where the Holy Spirit himself comes on the inside of you and he changes you. You are born again. You are alive unto God. Your spirit is alive. Your spirit is reborn. It doesn't have the nature of death. It doesn't have the nature of the enemy. You are born again. And so the thing is, God is using under this old covenant spiritually dead individuals who are doing their best to walk by the commandments of God and use their faith and partner with the Holy Spirit of God. Gideon was spiritually dead. You are not. You are born again. Number three, and this is very key. If you depend on external circumstances to determine the will of God, you can be and will be eventually deceived. If you depend on external circumstances to determine the will of God, you can and will be eventually deceived. Why? Because the enemy also have access to external circumstances. People say, well, God, if you really want me to do this, then, you know, let the book open to this page or, you know, let, you know, try to copy Gideon. Well, let me put the shirt outside. If the shirt is dry tomorrow, then I know that God, you want me to do this. No, no, no. Remember, the enemy has access to external circumstances. And plus, if something that ran a little bit be dry, somebody could walk by and spill something. The enemy and other people have access to external things. And so if you always depend on external leadings to know if God is speaking to you, you can be and will eventually be deceived. This is not how you're supposed to be led by God. You are a new covenant believer. 
Remember Romans 8, 14 and verse 16 says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. It didn't say that sons of God are led by fleeces. The sons of God are led by the spirit of God and the spirit bears witness. It gives evidence to our spirit. That's the primary way he leads us. Colossians 3, 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Another translation, act as an umpire to which you are called in one body and be ye thankful. You follow the peace of God. The spirit of God gives witness, gives evidence, gives peace to your spirit. John 10, three through four, Jesus says to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he brings out his own sheep and he goes before them. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. Skip me down to verse, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know the voice of God. Stop putting out fleeces. No more fleeces. Follow the voice of God. Say, I know the voice of God. Come on, say it out loud and put it in the chat. Say, I know the voice of God. Come on, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say it with some confidence. Jesus said it and I believe it. Say, I know the voice of God. Bonus time. Say, I know the voice of God. Praise God. So let's go to Judges chapter 7 and see what happens. Remember the second question. He said, where are the miracles? Verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So God says, you got too many people. If I send you out with this amount of people, guess what? Israel said, we did it ourselves. And so here's what's going to do. Tell everybody who's afraid to go home. And guess what? Thousands went home. So tell everybody's afraid to go home. And then they still had 10,000 left. And God said, you still got too many. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide the people into two groups. Let them go by the water. Tell them to get a drink of water. The people who just put their head in the river and just drink, that's one group. The people who scoop water in their hand and bring it to the face and laugh like dogs, that's another group. And so what happens? God says, pick the people who pick the water in their hands and laugh like dogs. You're going to war with them. And there was just 300 left. 300. Just 300 left to go to war. And so God tells Gideon, you read through chapter 7, he said, if you're still kind of nervous, you're still afraid to go to battle, I want you to go down, sneak to the enemy's camp, take this person with you, and go down there. So they go down, they sneak, and they listen. And just so happened, as Gideon or Jerubbabel was getting closer, he was listening to two individuals camp. And one said, I had this dream last night of a loaf of barley bread tumbling down the hill and knocking over a tent and flattening it. And the person said, that must mean that God has given Gideon of the Israelites victory over the Midianites and everybody with them. This is what they're talking about in the camp. They have this prophetic dream among the enemy and they have the interpretation and they know what's going to happen. And Gideon is suddenly emboldened. He goes back to his army, his army of 300. And he tells them what to do. They surround the camp. There's only 300 of them. They have a pitcher, they have a trumpet, and they have a torch. And he instructs them what to do. And the 300 blow the trumpet, and they shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. They smash the pots. And what happens? The camp of the Midianites are confused. They panic, and they begin to turn on each other. The confusion, and they begin to fight each other, destroy each other, and the rest flee. And so now God has given victory to Gideon is 300 and they begin to chase these people down. Remember Gideon's second question, where are the miracles? The miracles happen as Gideon obeyed God. Some of you have been believing for miracles and you need miracles. The, Gideon, the miracles happen as you act like Gideon and obey God and step out in faith and do what God has already told you to do. He's been sending you encouraging words and confirmations like this one, the other ones, just like he did Gideon to get Gideon on the move, to get Gideon moving. You've received your confirmation. You know what God wants you to do. I'm not saying that you're confused or you're not sure you're praying for clarity. You already know what God wants you to do. You need to take that step. And when you take that step, you'll run into the miracles of God. And so what happens, you get to end of chapter 7, you see the victory, you see Gideon having victory over his enemies. And when you get to Judges chapter 8, Gideon and his armies chase the Midianites. They encounter two cities among Israel that do not feed the armies or offer shelter or care for the army, for those 300. After Gideon wins the battle, now we see this change in Gideon. Remember, Gideon has a prompt to start, but he doesn't end well. 
One of the things you see after Gideon wins the battle, he returns and punishes the leaders of the cities and even kills the men of one of the cities. God didn't tell him to do that, but this is what he's doing. Now go to chapter 8, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment and each threw into the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that they requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around the camel's necks. Then Gideon made it into an ephah, which is a priestly garment, and set it up in his city Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare or a trap to Gideon and to his house or to his family. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash's father in Ophrah of the Bazarites. So it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their god. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of the enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubal Gideon in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. Now, as we said, this ephod is a priestly garment. Instead of worshiping God alone, the Israelites began to worship Gideon's priestly garment that was made of gold. Gideon had a promising start, but he didn't end the way, we, went the way he should. We see issues with him coming back from his victory. We see issues in him making this ephod, and then it became a trap. So this means Gideon's also involved with this idolatry. And the rest of Israel, so they're worshiping God and this priestly ephod. And then we see his family drop these unwise decisions in his family. These so many unwise decisions will lead to a bloody, bloody and costly battle after Gideon dies. And we'll get into it next time. One of the things we learn from Gideon is, yes, faith, but also how you finish. You must start strong, continue strong, and finish strong. You must start strong. You must continue strong, and you must finish strong. Some people start and never finish, and that's bad. Some people start, but don't finish the way they should. Gideon had a promising start, but he didn't finish the way he should, and it became costly for those who lived after him. It's important the way you start, but it's also important the way you continue, and it's important the way you finish. Do not compromise. Do not go after other ways. Do not forsake the way and the leading of the Spirit of God. Stick with the Holy Ghost. Stick with his ways. Stick with his guidance. Because not only will he empower you, but when you stick with his ways, you will always get the best results. Remember, we talked about these judges. Although the Holy Spirit will come upon them, they didn't always do what is right. And there were major consequences to their actions. And next week, we'll begin with the consequences to some of Gideon's actions and what happened as a result. And how it didn't just affect his family, but it actually affected multiple areas. We'll start there next week as we go on to another judge that the Holy Spirit used and anointed and see different things that we should learn from their lives so that we can fulfill the plan of God for our life. So the reflection question for you tonight is, what excuses are you putting before God? And the encouragement that I want you to focus on and remember, start strong, continue strong, and finish strong. We need you to fulfill the plan of God for your life. Praise God. Amen. I believe today's message encourage you, it strengthen you, it's helping you to live the lifestyle of faith. If you're ever in the Metro Atlanta area, we'd love for you to worship with us in person. You can find information about our different locations at fccga.com. Also, we have so many different ways where you can get the word. You can download our Faith Plus app. You could also visit us on our social media pages, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, 
on YouTube. We love for you to connect with us. We also have a podcast on Apple Podcasts as well as on Spotify. We have two. One is called the Faith Podcast, and then we have our daily devotional podcast, which is called Faith in the Morning. I look forward to seeing you on many different social media platforms and in person at Faith Christian Center. Thank you so much for tuning in. And remember, something good is going to happen to you today, so expect miracles. God bless.